Well, it's time now for perspective. There's a prevailing theory that people are either left-brained or right-brained. That is, that you're more analytical if the left side dominates and more creative if it's your right side. But reality is very rarely that black and white, as Ian McGilchrist explores in his book The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. Ian McGilchrist, a psychiatrist, lecturer and author, joins me now on set. Thank you very much for joining us here on Thank France 24. Much. Now, this book is a rethinking of what each side of the brain does and how the two sides essentially work in tandem with each other. What was the prevailing wisdom up until this point that you were trying to reassess here? Well, after the first split brain operations, which was the procedure that helped people with intractable epilepsy, were carried out in California in the 1960s, there grew up a sort of idea of the difference between the hemispheres. It became possible to assess each hemisphere separately. And there were a lot of rather naive things said, like that the left hemisphere is rational and linguistic and the right hemisphere is um, uh, sort of emotional and, you know, perhaps a bit pink and fluffy. But <laughs> it turns out that um, all of that is not true. However, there remains the extraordinary fact that the brain is divided and asymmetrical and that the two halves are quite careful to keep their working together as well as apart. And it's not just humans. This phenomenon can be seen across the animal kingdom. It goes all the way down. In fact, as far as the very first neural network we know of in a 700 million year old sea creature. So all neural networks are asymmetrical. Now, what about this title, The Master and His Emissaries? Slightly baffling at first glance. Yes. Uh, what's that a reference to? Well, it's uh, based very loosely on a hint in Nietzsche. Uh, the idea is that there was a man, uh, a master, a spiritual master, who looked after a community and he did it so well that it flourished and grew and at a certain point he realised that he couldn't look after all the business of the community but rather more importantly that he shouldn't try to do so because it was impossible to maintain an overall perspective while getting bogged down in detail and so he delegated his sort of brightest and best to go and do some work on his behalf and report back. But this emissary, this bright chap, thought, I know everything, I mean, which was just a sign of how little he knew. And he thought, I'm the one that's doing all the hard work here. What does this master know? And uh, so he adopted the master's cloak. And as a result, not knowing what he didn't know, um, the, commun the community fell apart. And the analogy there, for me, is that uh, contrary to received wisdom, the right hemisphere is, or should be, the overseer. And the left hemisphere does some interesting procedural work on behalf of the right hemisphere. But because it knows less than the right hemisphere, it thinks it knows everything. And I believe that our culture has become dominated by this way of thinking. And why is it exactly, do you think, that the modern Western world does privilege one side of the brain if we look at it in that way? Uh, do you mean in the sense of how did I come to that conclusion or why do I think it evolved in that way? How, do you, how did you come to that conclusion? Well, if you look at the differences between the hemispheres and they do many things together and similarly, but the important thing is the differences. It's not what they do, it's the attitude, if you like, the disposition they have towards reality, the way in which they engage with whatever it might be, reason, emotion, language or whatever, and they each have a consistently different way of doing it. And one is very fragmentary. It, it builds up a picture of the world out of little bits, which can be mechanically put together to build up a whole picture. And these bits are certain and they're fixed, they don't change, they're not really properly connected. And this leads to a picture of a world that is detached, robotic, mechanical. The right hemisphere is actually more in touch with reality in which nothing is ever static or disconnected from everything else. So it sees a whole picture in which everything is connected, flowing, changing, evolving and indeed animate. So you have on the one hand a machine-like vision of the world and on the other a complex, subtle, um, picture of a living world and I'm afraid that we seem to, these two hemispheres offer two models if you like of the way of looking at the world and I think if you look around you you'll probably agree with me that there is much that appears bureaucratic that is abstracted that is um, uh, if you like over um, uh, controlled.
Now, you did have a rather unusual start to your career uh, as uh, uh, a psychologist, psychiatrist. Yes. Uh, you actually started off by studying English literature. Yes. What do you think that has brought to your scientific practice? Um, I think it's quite important in scientific practice, particularly if you're dealing with human beings, as doctors are, to have a background in philosophy. And I, in fact, went up to Oxford to study theology and philosophy. I then read English literature and went back to philosophy and psychology. This interested me in the mind-body problem. And uh, to cut a long story short, the philosophers were rather disembodied. So I decided the thing to do was to study medicine. And in doing that, I came to it 10 years later than most people. But I brought with me a humanist background in which I didn't take it for granted that uh, the body and the human being were simple mechanisms. And you, then you think that some of your colleagues in the scientific community do take that for granted? I'm afraid they do. In fact, they get rather offended if, they, if you, they, you imply that actually this is a very unexamined, rather simplistic assumption. And how exactly do you hope that your findings are going to be implemented in the real world, if at all? Well, uh, I'm getting on in years. Uh, I'm a diagnostician. I think I've provided a diagnosis, in a way, of the sort of problems we have, to which people have been enormously responsive. I mean, I've sold 100,000 copies of this book, so obviously people like it. And one thing that's very good is wherever I go and speak, Particularly young people come up to me and say, this is fascinating. We're tired of um, the, the version of the world we're being told by people like Richard Dawkins and, and others. And we want to be able to see a broader, bigger, more living picture. Um, what can we do to help? And uh, what I want is for this perception of mine to be more widely disseminated, to be taken up by other people into their imagination. And they will come up with things to do. In fact, they will have to because I'll be gone and they'll be left with the world to, to sort out for themselves. Well, let's hope they do a decent job of it. Uh, Ian McGilchrist, a psychiatrist, lecturer uh, and author of The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. For coming on to speak to us here at France 24.